Hello and welcome. This is Tamara Anderson from Building Successful Lives Speech and Language Services. Welcome back to my interview series on culture, diversity, and equity. I have another wonderful guest today to talk about the topic, topic of cultural heritage. Her name is Stephanie Thomas Gilbert Roberts, and she's the Director of Strategy and Projects at Comedii, a Brussels-based nonprofit consultancy specialized in project management and advice in the creative and media sector in Europe and throughout the Americas and Caribbean. She's also the founder and creative editor of Cultural Voice, a global online magazine focused on business and culture that was founded in 2011. And those that follow my website and so forth are very familiar that I'm very interested in the discussion of culture. And we know that cultural heritage is a legacy of physical artifacts and it is also the intangible artifacts of various, that various individuals have within society. It may include books, works of art, monuments, the oral traditions that are passed down and performed through cultural, um, in cultural festivals and the performing arts. And most importantly, we know that cultural heritage affirms people's identity. And it is very important that it is preserved from one generation to the next, regardless of where you live in the diaspora. So I've asked Ms. Um, Stephanie Thomas Gilbert Roberts to share some information on this topic, which is very important. So if you can kindly share some information about your current professional work in the cultural and creative industry for my viewers today. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Tamara, and thank you for having me. And more and more, we understand the effects of mismatched representation and diversity in outcomes, and the need to move from what is to what should be, starting with conversations such as these and education. So let me thank you for leading this charge and being such an important voice in your own sphere. I hope my experiences can nuance your discussions and add fresh perspective. So thank you again. And in my work here um, in Europe, I'm based in Brussels. I work with Comedia, as you introduced. And this has, you know, this has been my, my history in the making. I've always engaged in culture and the arts as a dancer myself. I've done music. I, I've, you know, I, I'm, I love to write. Um, I come from a, a heritage of people who love to write. Um, writers. Uh, my own mother is a poet <laughs> um, and many in my family, you know, um, have strong oral heritage traditions, have strong cultural um, foundations. Um, so, you know, it is with great pride that, that I continue this and that I advocate um, for a greater understanding of cultural heritage and what it means to us. I think that is wonderful. And I know that you have the expertise and the knowledge and the interest to help with this dialogue. How do you think that we can contribute to preserving our cultural heritage through the generations while also demonstrating an understanding and appreciation of cultures? Well, you know, funnily enough, I believe that the two objectives support each other. Very important. That when we value cultural diversity, we are making room for the preservation of our own cultural heritage. Very, very important. And there are levels to this, of course. As Barack Obama articulates so well in his latest book, Promised Land, as an individual, we can approach things from a grassroots perspective, or we can go as far as tackling the structural solutions that will truly allow for the preservation of cultural heritage. This being at the level of policy advocacy. Uh, there are many other perspectives along the way, such as individual advocacy in our own sphere of influence. Now on a very local level and relating to my island home, Jamaica, Take, for example, the decision, a decision to rebuild a large theater house, um, such as the Ward Theater, which is in the heart of downtown Kingston, and which has for generations upon generations been a central hub for creativity in throughout all of the Caribbean, um, being one of the largest, if not the largest um, 
theater of its kind for many, many um, generations in the Caribbean. Of course, it's dilapidated, it cannot be used now, um, and it, it has been left abandoned. Now, there have been many causes to try to um, bring this back to life because you will see that it is something like that. Um, you know, can build on intangible and tangible um, elements of cultural heritage and can create repercussions um, that can really allow for the strengthening of cultural heritage. But this would necessitate the mobilization of so much, you know, resources from, you know, financial resources, human capital, um, resources on so many levels to make this possible. And so whereas as an individual, um, you, you know, can write poetry, you can um, make art, you can, you know, there's also the need to have a home for that art, to have the museums that display the art, to have the funding that supports this. So all these things have to work together um, to create ecosystems that support culture and the preservation of cultural heritage. Now, beyond this, as a member of the Jamaican diaspora community, now living in Europe for over six, year, six years and raising a young family, the implications of a discontinuity of cultural heritage as a member of the diaspora become um, so focused, so pinpointed for me. And it takes a concerted effort now to really think, how does this, how will this impact me on a personal level, the future generations of my family, um, now that I am outside of a natural environment in which I'm flooded with everything that makes me me. I think you touched, to interject a little bit, I think you touched on a Absolutely. lot of good points there. And I love what you said about in Jamaica, how they're trying to preserve the ward theater. And, you know, I come from a speech language pathology background and education sector. And performing arts is something that is in the public school system and in the private sector, but not as much, right? And I work right. in elementary level and private practice as well. Yes. And sometimes kids are exposed to the arts, but in certain areas it may be limited. And I think right. that's some way, a way that speech language pathologists and educators can lend itself to the students to participate in writing their own narratives, right? In Absolutely. A therapeutic exercise. You Absolutely. And so forth and have the kids write their own narratives, write their, their own I am poems to define, them, define themselves and their family. And also they can perform it, right? Write poems, perform the poet, the poetry in sessions or with their class, or if it's a Black History Month program or Native American Heritage Week, they can highlight various um, heritage and so forth. I think and also they can, if you know, depending on their cultural background, depending on their communities, they want they may want to advocate themselves for spaces, you know, which takes it, which makes it their own and, and takes it to another level. So can you imagine if you had um, young students who didn't think about it as, oh, I have to learn this, but I want to know more so that I can help my community to build a cultural space, you know, for the future that that is dedicated to, to to preserving the arts and culture and all of these things think about the difference in appreciation you know think about if they knew about the history of those who have done that before um and and you know and if they know those around them who really care about these things and who care that their voices will have um will have an outlet you know this is this is something that is um you know, could could make a huge difference uh, in someone's life. Uh, so I totally encourage what you say, um, Tamara, and for your network to really think about applied techniques, you know, finding initiatives that are happening around the world, highlighting them in your discussions, you know, highlighting them in your interactions with students, especially if they're from diverse backgrounds, you know, find things that are relevant to them. Um, I have, you know, friends who, um, who are at the intersection um, of, of culture and, um, you know, for example, Stephanie Bell Navis, who um, is a dance movement therapist. Um, and this is something that she, you know, practices in her everyday life and who that she advocates for. She's also a photographer. So she merges that practice and 
absolutely layers what she does with her creative skills. And I think this is open to many people. Eh? I think this is not this is not a closed field. I mean, Tammy, what you're doing here is 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 something that I'm sure parents of students who are you're interacting with will listen to and themselves um, understand more about the cultural context um, that 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 we all operate in. Absolutely. And from a speech pathology standpoint, the research shows that when you're more culturally responsive in a variety of ways, it's going to lead to greater student achievement and progress of goals for the kids with special needs. And last week we saw that with the presidential inauguration, Amanda, the youth poet, poet laureate, who had a speech impediment, and she was able to overcome that even into her college years. She could not properly articulate her R sound and she had an auditory and language processing deficit, yet she's a Harvard graduate. And we saw her so eloquently um, say her poem recently at the inauguration. So that is in itself is an example to the special needs children that I work with that have communication disorders and language disorders and dyslexia and things like that, that they can still achieve. They can still build a successful life for themselves. Oh, you couldn't have chosen a better example. So profound. I, I you know, I'm so proud of, of, of that. The, um, that performance and that message amazing and you know I think I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, speak a little bit uh, about I guess you know on what what it means to me my own cultural heritage you know um, you know Amanda in her presentation <laughs> she she made no bones about making it a lot about her journey within this whole journey you know and I think that we have to personalize things um, sometimes and people will come and and interact with us on that level um, so of course um, for me the first thing is understanding my strong multicultural Jamaican heritage eh? um, and understanding also within that the need to embrace and to try to understand the beauty of our retained African heritage within our stories. Now, yeah. very important. And, and this involves discussing the trauma of a people who were enslaved and transported across the Middle Passage forced removal and replanting and 400 years focused on eradicating and denigrating the memory of this African heritage. Um, you know, I think, I think sometimes we don't give that enough, um, enough discussion, dialogue. What does that mean now, you know? you know, now that you are in a new space, how does this affect you and how does it resonate? Um, because studies show that, that you know, there is so much retained, um, retained, you know, knowledge, um, so much retained creativity, so much retained trauma um, from these experiences that probably need to be aired. Um, and, and again, linking it to my journey here in Europe, um, understanding to love my new chosen culture and embrace it as a continuation of my story, realizing that in a few generations, the mix will in fact be a part of my family's heritage. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's like you, Tamara, in, 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 in the US, in the States, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in, in Atlanta, your whole journey, you know, it, this is now a part of your, your cultural legacy. Um, yeah. and what you are doing here and the interactions that you have here. And I'm sure so many of your, um, of your students are probably from all over the world, okay. um, you know, but, but their journey to the United States is an important part of what their culture is now. Um, and so, you, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a very, it's like a chain, you know, you keep adding, you yeah. keep adding layers, you keep adding, um, you keep adding to this and making it longer. Um, and, and in so doing and in, in having these discussions and not losing them, you know, you can, you can move towards acknowledgement, move towards preservation. I think that you touched on a lot of important things there and definitely touched on how your background has really shaped your professional work and your personal experience. Definitely yes. for me, the folks that follow me know that I was born in St. Andrew, Jamaica. My family immigrated when I was five to South Florida, which is a very diverse place, but it's important not to neglect the African side, but we have really been robbed of our history. 
I know yes. from the diaspora, we know that most Jamaican people are either from Ghana or Nigeria. And my family has done some research and my dad's side of the family is actually not from West Africa. They may have moved there, but it's from North Africa. So I'm also a family historian. So that's a whole nother side. Right, history. that's amazing. Yeah. Mother fair, it's quite fascinating because yes. I've been doing some, my mother and I and other family members, some genealogical studies and so forth. Um, related cultures, but also very distinct as a patriarch in the family. So the background, of, and then of course, being West Indian, you have all the different layers there too. You have the Sephardic influence, Sephardic Jews, the Spain and Portuguese who came in. And a lot of yes. people don't know the Caribbean people, they're by their names and so forth. They have a lot of that lineage within us. And many are truly oblivious to it in the Caribbean and Latin America, but it exists. Mm -hmm. You know, when they were kicked out of Europe, Spain and Portuguese, they came to the Caribbean and they came to Latin America and even Mexico. So that's a part of my DNA too that many people don't even realize. And then the British Isles, all of that is interconnected. And then you fuse that with American culture. It's a one big pot of soup, I say, right? But we thought of the African side is the predominant force and the cultural and the American experience. So all of that can help shape your professional experience. How? Because I can relate to people from all different walks of life because I represent the world. Amazing, <laughs> so it's, amazing. Which is so profound. And yes. another question I have there for you is how do the arts strengthen and affirm cultural values? And I love the arts. I love, I did ballet. I was not a prima ballerina, but I did ballet <laughs> when I was younger and modern dance in college. And I love going to the theater and all of these different things. And I love the arts in speech language therapy. I have the kids draw when we do stories, they write their different narratives, different things like that. How do you believe the arts strengthen and affirm cultural values in children and adults? Because I know you're raising a little one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you an example, eh? And this was, uh, this is an example from my early adult years. Mm -hmm. So I went to Colgate University, which is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And while at Colgate, I had the opportunity to study an advanced poetry class um, with Peter Balakian, an Armenian American poet, right, an academic um, who was recently awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. This is in 2016. So in this class, it, it, it took me all the way to Colgate to read the works of Derek Walcott. Now, Derek Walcott is one of the most important West Indian poets and dramatists. He won the Nobel Prize um, of literature for literature in 1992. Um, now, the the discovery of the works um, is that in his works, Walcott um, understands and um, and makes a big effort um, to bring forth in a beautiful way, the conflict between the heritage of European and West Indian culture. You know, the long way from slavery to independence and he considered himself a nomad between cultures. Now, this is such a nuanced perspective and so relevant to what we introduced earlier, um, Tammy, and what we were speaking about with this multiplicity of cultural influences, um, and especially when you are living in different societies. Um, now, this, my... Um, going to Colgate in upstate New York, studying Caribbean literature. And it became, the, my experience becoming real to me in that moment shows me how the arts strengthen and, and, and affirm cultural values. Absolutely. You know, this concept of transference and preservation of cultural heritage through the arts has not been more visible to me, you know? And, and so, representation again you Absolutely. know representation um you know when you are exposed uh, to the beauty of cultural diversity there is so much that can come out of this um and uh, you know um there are three major elements um that have catapulted my understanding of the complexity of appreciating cultural heritage um, in this way, you know, as an affirmation of values. And the first is dancing with the National Dance Theatre Company of Jamaica. 
um, in which, of course, we are looking at, kum, we're dancing kumina, gere, you're hearing the drums, you're in the rhythms, you know, it is just, it's, it's being in living history, you know, when you're in the NDTC. Um, the second is my travels and interactions as a Jamaican youth ambassador in the spheres of UNESCO, Forum of the Americas, CARICOM, and UN, UNAOC. It is meeting spectacular, outstanding individuals with such amazing stories from around the world who are changing the world. Um, you know, there, there's no way that you can, you cannot appreciate and understand how important discussions of culture um you know is when you when you you meet someone who has been through civil war um you know and 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 somebody who has used their voice to make a difference you know and you have these con um, conversations with people across the the dining table <laughs> you know um the third thing is my experience in cultural entrepreneurship. Um, as you introduced before the digital magazine, you know, it started from a blog and turned into an international digital magazine. Um, and, and through that, I, I heard so many people's voices. You know, I was able to connect um, across cultures, you know. Um, there was this amazing photographer um, that captured, you know, the, the 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 streets of the um of of indian cities you know and you could see just so much beauty even though you know in some there was affluence in some there was poverty in some it is it is this richness of understanding the universality of human nature you know Absolutely. that that comes through even in photography um and especially in photography um you know so 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 art affirming cultural values yes please <laughs> yes, i signed up for that too and, and i love that it's affirmed through the dance and ddc through music mm -hmm. right through the dialogues you may have if you meet somebody for dinner along different ways and yes for children when children interact with people from school and different community events whether it's soccer whether it's football whether it's dance we're living in a multicultural society so people need to know how to interact with persons from different cultures and so forth and it affirms their identities and shows appreciation. What tips do you have that you found beneficial when, when interacting with colleagues and clients from diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds? So I know if you're in Atlanta, there's growing diversity, but not everyone grew up around people from various backgrounds and cultures, and they may think you just need to assimilate into American culture. That is a one, that's a one mindset. You should assimilate, forget about where you're from, and just assimilate. But I don't do not believe so because that is a complete erasure of one's mm -hmm. identity. And it's just wrong. It's just flat yeah. wrong. You know? It's good yeah, to integrate, integrate, mm -hmm. right? Don't lose a part yeah. of who you are. You integrate and you take on the American values, which are wonderful as well, different parts, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so what are your tips? Okay, the first thing I'd say is invite people to dinner. That is the first thing, you know, I mean, COVID, okay, we can't invite people to dinner, but, you know, post COVID, we will be able to see each other again. And when we do, you know, think about who are the most interesting people in your sphere and invite them to dinner, you know, and I find that people are very relaxed around a dinner table um, and have a diverse menu, you know, have everyone carry their own dishes. It's a great way to start conversation. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is very practical, but I find it to be very relevant. Um, also exchange music, you know, exchange musical preferences. Um, be ready to um, be ready to learn about folk music, of Armenia or, you know, or, or, or to dance or to dance, you know, um, Af Af you know, to Afrobeat music or to, you know, there's so many different things or to go to a ballet recital. I mean, so many different things that um, you can do, but really what that amounts to is sharing your own um, you know, first of all, acknowledging that you do have a complicated um, and beautiful story and learning more about your own story um, and finding interesting ways to share your story and to listen. You know, once you have shared and opened it up and made the atmosphere open enough, um, 
listen to what others are saying, especially when they're trying to do exactly what you are doing, because everybody, you know, likes to be heard um, and, and likes to, to feel that you're truly connecting um, with them on a different level. So, yeah. I love the, the, about inviting, I'm a foodie, so inviting to dinner and I like to have dinner parties at my house and when I can, it's small, yeah. and then, you know, going out in Buckhead yeah, and yeah. Atlanta as well. But yeah, yeah, now have a diverse table. It's, it's, I've always had a diverse group of friends and, in Miami, college years, and here in Atlanta as well. And yeah, I like so, about listening, listening mm -hmm. to what folks are saying. I'm right. Accordingly. So just just a little anecdote. So here I am in Brussels. Brussels is the second most cosmopolitan city in the entire world. So it is very rare that you go to dinner with a group of people and you do not have a very diverse table. Um, and so this is one of the beautiful things I love about living here in Brussels. Um, it really affords an open conversation. Which is extraordinary. That's wonderful. You know, and that leads yes. into my final question about what do you see as a benefit of a global society? And I would say mm -hmm. there's definitely an increase in heightened exchange of an ideas across various sectors. You work in the business and nonprofit sector. I work in public and private sector as well with my business. But how do you, what do you see as a benefit? And how can we foster greater collaboration between the sectors? That's why I invited you on here today because you're in a different sector. However, I believe the sectors such as art, business, education, how can we foster the collaboration for the purpose of being more culturally responsive in our individual communities and our communities in the diaspora? Because I think it's needed. I think if we really connect, then we can really make some gains in a variety of ways. So on a very practical level, because I've been taking it very practical in this interview, um, what a lot of companies are doing at all levels is hiring creative directors. Mm -hmm. Now, what a creative director does is basically go looks at innovation from a different perspective. Um, they use, uh, many of them use um, design methodology um, to break apart how things have been done for um, countless years and redesign it in ways um, that can be more inclusive, that can be more in line um, with trends uh, in society and that can potentially lead to, um, to, to, to the effects that, you know, you have more voices at the table, which is really what we want. So that's from a business perspective and a, and a very practical thing. Also diversity on boards helps this, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we see in increased conversations about who is at the board level in business, you know, and this sets the this sets the tone for for your entire business operations. So have creative people at that level as well, um, creative and diverse. Now, in terms of in education, um, you know, one of the arts arts in education is something that so many are advocating for. So you you've always had STEM, yeah. Now you have STEAM. And the A that is added to STEM is the arts. Um, and so if we change how we, um, how we prioritize, because studies have shown that the arts um, are as important as math in many cases, um, then we can really um, start harnessing that, not forgetting that we're also speaking about diversity within the entire STEAM, you know? Absolutely. The stream of steam. Yes, I love that. And I love what you said about hiring diverse people in the creative industry. Um, even the school setting, whether it's public school or private setting, they can invite persons to speak to children from a like, high museum of art here in Atlanta or different, um, different cultural festivals that may be going on. We can advocate that and make, you know, invite parents and stuff to participate in those different cultural festivals and so forth. So I think there, there's ways that we can really have diverse people on a platform, um, whether it's a public school system, superintendents, board of education, you know, departments of health, whatever the sector is in art, in business and all of that, I think it's very important. And then to continue to have the dialogues, right? And to be um, caring and kind and compassionate in the school setting, in the private sector, I always say, when you show children and families that you care, 
they will love to come to speech and language therapy. They will be racing down to come and <laughs> learn the skills that you're trying to teach them. And it's important for them to have field trips. Some schools, they no longer do field trips. You know, budget with COVID, it's not happening now, but field trips and experimental learning is very important. So that way they can get exposure to going to plays and going to dance and going to theater. They can see the art performed and then they can learn to embody that, right? Take a dance class, take a sports you know, go to a sports match, different things like that. And just knowing that to have good interpersonal skills is really the key to be truly in, culturally responsive. So whether you're a teacher or an administrator, you have to be able to communicate with diverse staff. One, first, hire them. <laughs> hire them. Yep, Give absolutely. them a seat at the table. Yeah. Give them a seat at the table in leadership. And then from there, there will be a constant dialogue and improvement, you know? And I think this has been a wonderful, wonderful topic. And we, I think I may have to invite you back another time for some other. Uh, avec things. plaisir. And I think for speech language pathologists and educators, for those of the folks that, you know, visit my website, it is very important for them to understand the significance of cultural heritage. You know, we cannot just erase one's cultural heritage. Although they have to teach the standards, although we have IEP goals for kids with communication disorders, language disorders, and literacy disorders, kids with dyslexia, there are ways that you can be culturally responsive. You know, you can have a pause. First is awareness. We have to have proper learning partnerships between the therapists, the families, the teachers, the administrators. We have to give them ways to, to process information. And the children that I work with have processing deficits, right? So when we do things with the art, it's visual. They respond well to visual. So giving them an opportunity to use pictures, you know, different things that they can do. And it's a way, to, way for them to think critically about information as well. When they think critically about things that they're reading or listening to ones that are learning to read, it's very important. And um, just being culturally responsive is an excellent way to maximize their success with communication skills, language, literacy, all of that. And preserving the cultural heritage is key as well because it provides the children and the adolescents effective ways to process the information orally. And my whole business, building a successful life. I want children, adolescents, and families to build a successful life for themselves. And it does not necessarily mean monetary success, even though that would be the icing on the cake. It is truly to be able to offer something meaningful to society, right? That they Fantastic. Have something yeah. to contribute Thank you. To Thank you. That is the end Thank result, you. right? So what are you Thank contributing? You. What is your legacy? And culture should not be negated. It is something to be honored, respected, appreciated, celebrated, and we can all learn from each other. You know, absolutely we're all similar. Certain things that are this similar. is this is a tip of the iceberg. There's so things that are different, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We just have a few more minutes to wrap up. So any other closing remarks and so forth? This has been a wonderful discussion on cultural um, heritage and yeah. And how the different sectors can come together, education and speech language therapy world, the arts and so forth, creative industries. Yeah, no, I, I would just encourage um, your listeners, you know, to really think how you can apply some of what's said here. Um, and, uh, and, and I thank you, Tamara, for your efforts. Um, I think that if one person um, includes some rich material, some culturally diverse material, some um, some more art and culture um, into the work that is being done, that it can change lives. Absolutely. And so what is more important? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this interview, Miss Stephanie Thomas Gilbert Roberts. I wish you all the best in your professional and personal life and have a great day. 